Good afternoon, and welcome to the first of three presentations in the ELEX Annual 2012 Online Pre-Conference, Local Collections Collective Context, Managing Print Collections in the Age of Collaboration. I'm Jessica Phillips, host of today's pre-conference. Today's presentation is Shared Collection Management, Collaborative Decision Making, with Doug Way, Rick Lug, Ruth Fisher, and Barbara Cockrell. Doug Way is the Head of Collections and Scholarly Communications at Grand Valley State University, where he previously held positions as Head of Liberal Arts Programs and as Government Documents Librarian. Doug has written and spoken extensively on the use of academic library collections, collection management, and scholarly communications. He holds a master's degree from Wayne State University in Library and Information Science. Rick Lug and Ruth Fisher are the principals of Sustainable Collection Services. Rick has worked with academic libraries since 1983. As a consultant and vendor, he has written approval plans, streamlined workflows, evaluated collections, and designed library-friendly products and services. He holds an MLIS from Simmons College. In 2007, Rick saw a growing need to weed monographs collections, responsibly, efficiently, and cost-effectively. His interest in this unlikely topic is partly karmic. Having spent the first half of his career putting books into libraries, he must now spend the second half taking them back out. Ruth was born in Washington, D.C. She graduated from Earlham College with a B.A. in American Frontier History, and she holds a Master's in Education from Penn State. For 10 years prior to founding R2 Consulting, Ruth was a key contributor at YBP Library Services in the design and implementation of approval plans, cataloging, and shelf preparation services, profiling decision support tools, and GOBI. Ruth has two grown children, an artist and an engineer. Barbara Cockrell is an Associate Dean for Collections and Technical Services and an Associate Professor at Western Michigan University Libraries. She has a Master's Degree in Library and Information Science from Wayne State University and a Doctorate in Biological Sciences from Oxford University. She has authored a number of peer-reviewed scholarly articles in both library and biological sciences and has made several state and national presentations. Dr. Cockerell provides leadership, accountability, and advocacy for the library's collections-based services. She manages the collections budget and negotiates print and digital purchases and licenses. She leads the library's investigation of new collection delivery methods, standards and tool sets, and assures long-term access to purchased and created collections. If you have any questions for any of the presenters, please type them into the question box on your screen, and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. Also, please note today's session will be recorded, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording shortly after the conclusion of the webinar. A copy of the slides will be, available, or will be provided. You are invited to use the Twitter hashtag, SharedPrintMGT, as you see on the slide here, to interact with other participants during the webinar. However, please continue to submit questions for the presenters using the question box on the screen, as neither the presenters nor the host will monitor Twitter during the presentation. Please note that there may be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Doug. All right, thank you, Jessica. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is just sort of the origins and development of the Michigan Shared Print Initiative, um, sort of how we got started, sort of the background on that. Um, just to begin, what the Michigan Shared Print Initiative is, or MySpy as we call it, it's a collaborative effort among members of the Michigan Council of Library Deans and Directors Group to manage uh, print legacy collections. Um, the cold group, as we call the Michigan Council, is made up of the four-year state institutions in Michigan. We're doing this in conjunction with the Midwest Collaborative for Library Services, or MCLS, which is the library consortia for Michigan and Indiana, and along with uh, Sustainable Collection Services. The member libraries of the pilot, you can see here, um, it started with seven libraries, and we just added our eighth library to the group there. So as far as types of libraries, it really ranges from master's large institutions all the way up to research universities with a very high research activity. That, that one university that beats that category is Wayne State, and they're also an ARL library as well. 
looking at collection sizes, again, we have on one hand Wayne State with a very large collection all the way down to some me medium-sized academic library collections at Grand Valley State, Saginaw Valley State, and Michigan Tech. Now, in Michigan, we've had some history of working together and some collaboration um, on a limited basis. We have Michigan, which is really a reciprocal borrowing agreement among member libraries where patrons from our libraries can go to other libraries and borrow materials from them. We have MELCAT, which is our statewide union catalog, which allows uh, patron-initiated interlibrary loans. And then we have RIDES, which is a statewide delivery service, um, mainly folks in MELCAT. We've also done uh, a lot of consortial e-journal and database purchasing in the state, but really that's kind of the extent of it there. We've really had no one forcing further cooperation. All the state universities in Michigan are independent. Uh, there's not one statewide board of regents, which has a lot of advantages. When it comes to working together, though, perhaps there's a little bit of nobody with a stick, stick whacking us over the head telling us that we need to work together a little bit more there. So why did we sort of take this a step further and begin working on a shared print project there? Well. What I want to talk about next is Grand Valley's experience and sort of what we saw and sort of how we've changed over the past few years. So maybe give an example from one library why we want to participate. So at Grand Valley, we've really had a change in philosophy for the last several years, this idea of moving from building collections to curating access to information there. And based a lot of it is in a lot of the studies that have been out, um, some old, some newer. I think if you look at, go back to the Kent study in the 1970s, looked at the University of Pittsburgh, they found 40% of the books in that collection never circulated. Cornell came with a study a little more recently. They found 55% of the books published since 1990 in their collection had never circulated. At Grand Valley, overall, about 30% of our collection has never circulated. So I talked to my librarians to talk about how we spend about $600,000 a year on monographs, which means every year we're wasting about $200,000 on books that didn't really meet our users' needs there. So we've been trying to find different ways to um, provide access to that information. We look at studies on, you know, showing how it's expensive to keep things on our shelves there. The Crant and Nielsen study from a couple of years ago where it found that it cost $4.26 per volume per year to keep books on the shelves, and which really, we took about, you know, 40% of a collection or 30% of a collection not being used at all, not even talking about, that's the zero-use titles, not even talking about those one or two-use titles that are really in the long tail there. It's cost us a lot of time, space, and money, and really opportunity that we could be doing other things with that space or with that money or that staff time there. And perhaps the last couple studies to talk about that really influenced our view of the collections. Obviously, the True as Well study, one of the classic studies, where we got the 80-20 rule, which was really updated last year with the Ohio Lincoln OCLC study. It says well, really not 80-20, it's 86, where 6% 6 of the library's collection is really driving 80% of its use there. So at Grand Valley, what we try to do is meet, realize that our users need immediate access to that 6% of our collections, and for the rest, looking at a sort of shared print um, solution makes a lot of sense. So while the studies, I think, have been very influential, and a lot of studies, again, are very old studies, it doesn't always lead you to change your actions there. And we've had a couple of events that sort of happened to us that really sort of reinforce that we need to do things differently. The first one I kind of like to call the Great Mold Incident of 2010. Uh, we have a storage facility. It's a really classy, um, about uh, almost a hundred-year-old warehouse in the edge of downtown Grand Rapids, where we keep our storage books there. And like old warehouses, we had a leaky pipe that sort of slowly dripped some water. And once we found it, um, we ended up with about 129 damaged books there. And so, first thing we did before we had the librarians look at those books was had my assistant go through and see how many of those books were held by libraries in our in Melcat or statewide union catalog. And she found that 128 of the 129 damaged books were widely held. And this is in a storage facility with about a 1% circulation rate, which is kind of the norm for, for storage facilities there. So very low use titles there that were really widely held there. The other thing that sort of changed our thinking was a storage weeding project we worked on with SCS. We were one of the pilot libraries that worked on with them on setting up this rules-based, data-driven approach to deselection. And in this project, we reviewed about 38,000 books in one summer and withdrawing about 33,000 of them. And one of the criteria that our librarians commonly used was um, how many libraries in the state held this book. And I think probably if you've done weeding projects, a lot of you have done the same thing, where we look at how how easily can we get our hands on this? And if it's widely held in the state, then I can probably get through MELCAT or patients aren't going to have a lot of inconvenience on that. Which on the one hand makes a lot of sense, but when we step back and think about it, what we really realize is that we're operating in a vacuum there. 
we're assuming that other libraries are going to hang on to books that we're withdrawing. Other libraries are probably withdrawing books, assuming we're going to hang on to those books there. But we're not talking to each other about these things. We're sort of operating independently. And so we begin to ask ourselves a grand value is, what if we stopped acting independently? What if we actually took the time to figure out what the level of, de -dupli of duplication among our collections in the state were? How many of those books are actually in the long tail? So how much you know, overlap do we have? And then how many of those books aren't getting any use at all or hardly getting used at all? What type of, and then try to figure out what type of opportunities that would create for us um, as we partner with other libraries, and then whether that could lead to other areas of cooperation there. And so we were having these sort of discussions in the Grand Valley and conversations with Barbara, uh, who you'll hear from a little bit later, they were really having the same discussions at Western Michigan University as well. And so Barbara and I really decided we should really bring this to a cold group meeting. And so we sort of moved the idea forward, brought to this idea um, to the cold librarians, the collection development librarians. We meet about twice a year to talk about collection development issues. And we just said, hey, should we take this time to try and figure out, you know, throw all our collections in the pot, stir it up, see how much overlap we have there, and figure out, you know, is there a lot of overlap, is there not? And there's a lot of interest among the collection development librarians. They brought it back to their institutions. And um, things actually started rolling from there. Um, again, we had a lot of cooperation, but this really got things going. Sandy Yu, who's the dean at Wayne State University, was very interested in the project. She contacted Randy Dykeis, who's the director of MCLS, and said this is something we should be working on there. And we knew right from the start getting MCLS involved was going to be one of the sort of essential components of this project. I don't have a lot of experience um, working with lots of other libraries, and no one really in our group really did. But MCLS really had so that experience. They had the infrastructure. This is going to cost money. How do we get libraries to chip in the money that would be needed there? And we really needed leadership as well. Um, you know, I can't call up a library dean and say, hey, this is a project you should get involved in, but Randy can. So getting MCLS involved is really an important component there. And then equally important was getting SCS to work with us. So again, it's very easy to say, oh, we should just sort of take our collections and put them in a pot, stir it up, and see what we get there. But the reality is, you know, just normalizing the data and getting this data crunching to happen was really uh, very difficult. But working with SCS, they're really able to bring this sort of data-driven model that we use for weeding projects to this consortial shared print project. Um, getting ready for this um, webinar, one of the things I did was ask my colleagues in the state that are pilot libraries, you know, why do they participate in this? So um, it's one of those questions we really never asked ourselves, well, why are you in it, why are you in it? And what was interesting was that space concerns was an, it was an issue for some libraries, but it was really a minority of libraries. For the majority of libraries, it was just really a desire to collaborate on collection management issues there. Even though we hadn't done it in the past, there was this you know, if we could make it work, that's something we're all really interested in participating and being involved in there. So um, it's certainly sort of aha moments for me that, you know, even though we don't always work together on things, it doesn't mean that we don't want to do it. We just don't know how to do that. And so um, hopefully, as you see, we talk about this project, and see this is a really very manageable way to work together. Our project has a lot of yield and a lot of value for our libraries. As far as the scope of the project, um, sort of two parts of it. SES was going to analyze member collections. They were going to identify the overlap in the collections and then also identify titles that were commonly held that had very little or no circulation history. Really, it was just circulation, it was just usage history there. We, did, we defined usage very broadly as libraries defined it. And then the member libraries were going to determine how and really whether to collectively manage collections. So again, early on in the pilot, let's, let's just see what the overlap looks like and whether we should do something from that. And when Rick and Ruther talk about the numbers here, you'll see it was very easy for us to see very early on that there's going to be a lot of yield for libraries in this. And so we ultimately agreed to properly manage a subset of the, our member libraries' collective collection. Uh, as far as the project scope, again, it was monographs only. We did include multi-volume monographic sets, which um, that's some interesting issues. We avoided serials. A lot of us have been very aggressively weeding journals. We didn't feel like we needed yet another JSTOR project. We avoid special collections. We didn't want to touch government documents and reference reserves. We were looking at, looking at circulating collections there, circulating monograph collections. So those things were excluded as well. As far as the deliverables we received, each library received a collection overview, um, which is sort of a snapshot of the collections and how they compared to other libraries. And then we received an actual unique title list, a withdrawal list, and a retention list. And I'll talk about each of those just briefly. 
So the unique title list. These were unique locally held titles. I have a list. I have a list of unique titles for Grand Valley. Barbara has one for Western Michigan. Wayne State has unique titles there. And this is really important to us early on, especially as we were trying to figure out how to make, collectively manage this. We weren't sure if we were going to try and work together on our entire collections or a subset of our collections there. And for some libraries that had very big space concerns and large unique collections. Um, this was a major issue. Wayne State, for example, they were the only library in the group at that time had a, had a medical school, had a medical library, and that they also have a law school, so they have a, they have a law collection as well there. So they had a lot of unique content there. And so we wanted to find a way that we could preserve access to information but allow flexibility for libraries to work together. And it was a lot of compromise. And as we went through all this whole project, that was really the key is compromise, 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 trying to keep the group together while still moving forward on something that would work for everybody there. So on the unique title list, these were books that libraries could act on however they wanted to. And it was pre-2005 titles that had zero circs since 1999. And then they were held by uh, either 50 libraries in the United States or they were also preserved or they were preserved in the Hadi Trust there. So each library got a list of these titles and the group said, do with them what you want. Uh, if you want to withdraw them, that's great. If you want to hang on to them, that's great as well. Sort of the, the more overlap shows themselves in the withdrawal list and the retention list. In the withdrawal list, each library got a list of books that they were able to withdraw. And these books that had three or fewer circulations since 1999 among the entire group. It wasn't just three circulations at Grand Valley and three circulations at Eastern Michigan. It was three circulations at all seven pilot libraries total. Um, they were published or added to the collections prior to 2005, and they were held by more than two libraries, and that was important because, again, to be able to withdraw a book, we had we set it up so that two libraries would be retaining a copy of each of these books in the shared collection there. So the counter side to the withdrawal list was the retention list there. So um, I, I can withdraw books. I know that two libraries in the group are hanging on to uh, that same book there. And so this was a list that we really felt was important for us to have, that we knew exactly what books we were expected to hang on to and retain there on behalf of the collection, collective collection. And the retention assignments for this were really assigned to um, circulation as much as possible. It wasn't always possible. The idea here was that if I have a book that's had zero circulations and then two other libraries have it and it's actually circulate those two libraries, I'm going to be more likely to be able to get rid of that book. So I'm not hanging on to books that have zero use while other libraries being offered to get rid of a book that's been circulated maybe three times at their library. So trying to do as much as possible, but it doesn't always work out because a lot of what we did was sort of described as horse trading there where again libraries that had weeding issues need to get rid of a lot of books as many as possible. We sort of so sort of spreading out the retention evenly. Some library, libraries had a much heavier retention load where they were saying, we have space, we're not looking to weed at this point in time, so we'll hang on to more, and other libraries can perhaps be able to get rid of more than sort of their fair share if it's in a certain way. So that's sort of the basic background of our project. And Rick and Ruth will get into more details, and Barbara will later on talk about the MOU. What I want to do now is pass it on to um, Rick at SCS. I think I've got a picture here of the uh, SCS World Headquarters where they're monitoring weeding projects all across the uh, globe, I believe. So uh, pass it on to Rick now. There may be just a slight delay again as we switch users, so just bear with us there. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Doug. It's um, it's actually very nostalgic to see that picture of the uh, the data center. We've 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 outgrown that data center at this point, so that's kind of our old data center and uh, um, yeah it just brings back some nice memories. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about this project from the perspective of um, SCS as a as a vendor, as a startup vendor actually in this case and uh, I think one of the things that's important about this project is how sort of entrepreneurial it, 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 it proved to be on all sides. We, we, had, we saw Doug talk about the way that the project evolved among the, the Michigan academic libraries, that there were a group of them coming together to um, address a common concern, how to share collections, print collections, um, especially low-use print collections. And I think one of the things that is most impressive about this project is, is sort of um, how practical it has been, that we were in a very short amount of time evolving both a tool and, and a group and a decision-making process to, to grapple with some of these issues. As you can see on this project timeline here, we 
we've concluded our initial discussions about what we wanted to try and do in July 2011. And mainly in September and October of 2011, we at SCS began doing significant amount of data work. And over time, uh, there were a number of discussions, there were a number of iterations of that data that had to be, to be looked at. There were a number of decisions that had to be made. And the way that the, the data actually informed and accelerated those decisions, I think, is one of the most um, useful aspects of this project. Um, basically, the bulk of the work here was done in about a six-month period between September 2011 and March 2012. And um, it was after that that we, after we'd made those decisions, we began producing the actual withdrawal candidate lists after that point. So um, very, um, I think very much a grassroots kind of effort, like uh, uh, as opposed to some of the other shared print uh, efforts that are going on out there, there's really great work being done by um, the folks in the Western Regional Storage Trust, for instance. There's all kinds of talk about uh, what I sometimes call the FDIC layer, how are we going to create a national or a collective collection to make sure that print is, is uh, well secured and well represented. Uh, but this is almost from the other end of it. We're looking for uh, trying to solve problem, uh, a problem experienced by individual libraries and kind of building up from individual libraries to a small regional group. So I think it's, it's kind of unique in that way. I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we did. Uh, before I go further, I do want to mention, Ruth and I are both on this call today, but uh, our partners, Eric Redman and Andy Breeding, did a huge amount of work on this project. Uh, Eric is kind of our database wizard. He lives somewhere up in the Amazon cloud. We're not exactly sure where, but uh, he's very busy up there all the time. And then Andy is our sort of query meister. He, I bet he spent more time with MCLS data than, than uh, anyone on Earth during the uh, th during this project, and we want to acknowledge how much work they did and how important it was. And what they were working with was data, and I want to talk a little, little bit about the preparation process at, at our end. I'm going to start at a high level, and then we'll turn it over to Ruth in a few minutes to to look at some of the the more specific aspects of this. But this was this was a bit of a new project for us. We were ingesting. Uh, data from seven libraries at one time, and this included bibliographic data, circulation data, and item holdings data. And bibliographic data is pretty good to work with. It's fairly standard. The MARC record is a venerable format, been around since 1968. We all know a lot about it, and uh, normalizing bibliographic data is, is, a, is a reasonably straightforward and understandable task. Uh, we did things like filtering out out-of-scope records, um, Doug mentioned that this was a monographs project. We got some serials and GovDoc records and the extracts that we received, so we filtered those kinds of things out. A lot of normalization of, of call numbers, enumeration data, ISBNs, taking out trailing spaces, validation of numbers and the like, and, um, and, and most importantly, uh, matching the seven individual library data sets around an OCLC number so we could have a single comprehensive list of of uh, MCLS data. While BIB data is relatively standardized, let's say, uh, circulation data is not so much. Um, there are very, very different data practices and very different uh, ways of capturing circulation and other usage data in libraries. In this particular case, we had, we had four libraries on Millennium, three on Voyager. Both of those systems categorize and, and capture um, data related to circulations and checkouts somewhat differently. Um, total charges is, is sort of the most comparable uh, across systems, the, the total number of times that something's been used. But some systems capture uh, activity from year to date. Sometimes there are historical charges where data has been carried in a migration from a, from a previous system. Different types of different, <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> Different types of internal um, usage counts. Uh, sometimes those are captured in circulation numbers. Sometimes they're not. And they, they might be something as simple as uh, scanning something that's being reshelved from in-library use to something that is a little more of a gray area, uh, where, where some libraries check things out to individual departments, uh, such as bindery or preservation, that are working on things. You know, what counts as, as, a, as a legitimate checkout or use? 
do, you know, some in, sometimes uh, interlibrary loan is incorporated, sometimes not. Our premise was to be broad in this case and to think that any use should be counted and uh, to recognize that we probably weren't capturing everything because not everybody uh, tallies in-house uses. Where that information came from varied widely from system to system. Uh, the source column here gives you some idea. In, a, in, in some environments, it's fairly uh, straightforward. In others, it has to be derived from um, holdings or item records and the like. But uh, uh, many ways to get at that. And our, our concern initially was to get a common data set for circulation that if we're going to look at circulation across a group of seven libraries, we need to find out what is the shared circulation history. And I think we got very lucky in this case uh, in that we, we, we really have about 11, almost 12 years of circulation history across all of the libraries in the group. Some have more than that, uh, but no one has less than that. And it's a, it's a pretty good, robust um, circulation history uh, to start with. Item and holdings data poses some of its own issues. There's, again, a lot of variety here, different record structures in Millennium and Voyager. Uh, the location field proved especially um, varied in its uses. Uh, people use location for lots of things that do not have anything to do with where something sits on a shelf. And we had to learn a lot about that, learn which ones mattered, which ones didn't, um, and, and validate, validate that with each library individually all trying to get uh, a sort of uh, consistent and reliable data set across all seven libraries. So what we ended up in the, within the end, uh, we loaded uh, on the top left there, we loaded four and a half million bibliographic records. We filtered that down to um, what became the working data set, 3.8 million bibliographic records, which uh, extrapolated to 4.2 million item records. Uh, and of that, uh, we're going to be talking quite a bit about that data set for the next few minutes here, but that 3.8 million is really the, um, the key. Uh, of that, 1.3 million were unique titles, and uh, I would point out in the lower right here that uh, sometimes in the course of doing this normalization work, we find instances where uh, things like data remediation are possible, where we identified here a couple hundred thousand records where local holdings were not set, and we were able to uh, pass that information back and get those holdings set. Working with that 3.8 million records, we, uh, we then did a little bit more work to match uh, the MCLS data set to external sources. The, the, the biggest one and, and probably the key to the project really is, uh, is WorldCat. Um, we have an arrangement with OCLC that allows us to use their um, uh, their WorldCat API uh, to look up holdings of uh, how widely something is held by the libraries in our in our uh, source data sets. And we're looking there to identify holdings at the national level, how many in the aggregate are in the U.S., how many in the state level. We chose to do the that matching very specifically on, on OCLC number with um, Ferber uh, work families uh, turned off initially. We wanted these to be as, as addition specific as possible and as conservative as possible. And so that data set we'll go into in just a minute. We also ran matches against the Hathi Trust API to determine uh, which titles were digitally archived. And because six of the seven libraries uh, subscribed to choice, uh, there was interest in looking at uh, which of the titles that were low circulation um, also had been previously reviewed in choice. So pulling all that data together is really the, the first step. And uh, our work uh, from that point on was to present this data in in ways that could be actionable for the MCLS group, in ways that would um, support decision making and uh, put things in context. This will be a little bit of a hard slide to, to read, so I'm not going to linger on it, but this is, this is really one of the, an, an extract from what we call the SCS collection summary. You can see that number, 3.8 million up here, and you can see how those are dispersed across the um, the participating libraries here. And oops, excuse me. Um, there's a couple of things here that are worth pointing out. We're, we're sort of stratifying and looking at the data in terms of circulation counts, WorldCat matches, date-related counts, and electronic surrogates. So just picking out a couple of points here. 46% of those 3.8 million records uh, had no charges in the 11 years of circulation data that we had. So that's zero charges in that period. 
if we go up one notch, zero to one charge, uh, there 63% of the records had no activity uh, or had only a single activity during that period and so forth. So we're looking down at these kinds of uh, categories. Um, when we get down to the matches with the Hati Public uh, Hati Trust, 3% of their records um, matched up with Hati Trust Public Domain, 41% within copyright. Um, good to know in terms of archiving security, uh, unclear at, um, at this point whether we could act on that. So since that chart is tough to read, um, we chose to try and present the data visually whenever possible. So here, for instance, is a, a pie chart of the um, unique records within the group. Uh, 1.3 million um, unique BIB records out of that 3.8 million. Most of them at the biggest libraries, no, no big surprise there. What did surprise us a little was that every library, even the smallest libraries, had significant numbers of unique titles in their collections, and that uh, had implications later on. Uh, looking, again, drilling into the data, looking at circulation levels, um, zero circs in the blue here, zero or one circ, zero, one or two circs. Um, so you can kind of see the progression here. These um, uh, titles at this end of the spectrum are the ones that had circulated more times than, than, um, than two. So interesting to see that. Interesting also to look at overlap. Uh, how many of these titles were held by all by six or seven of the libraries? How many by four of the libraries? How many by two of the libraries? And and there's as you're beginning to grapple with what kinds of um, what, how many copies do you want to keep in the group and uh, which ones are important to make sure are are archived and which may be less so. Which ones are used and so forth. Drilling into the data in this way can be very very helpful. Looking specifically within the state of Michigan, uh, what portion of the titles are held by more than 10 other libraries in Michigan? And that was a significant number. 29% of these titles, 1.1 million volumes, were held by more than 10 Michigan libraries. Within the U.S., uh, again, uh, I pointed this out on the, on the earlier slide, 62% uh, are held by more than 100 libraries in the U.S., um, and 77% are held by more than 50 libraries in the U.S. So what are the, this, this is all about the context and uh, how to make these decisions, uh, how, how this data can inform the kinds of retention decisions and withdrawal decisions that, um, that libraries need to, uh, to confront. It's one thing to look at uh, individual factors and to see what kinds of, um, you know, how many of this and how many of that. But the real power, I think, of, of working with the data is the ability to combine multiple data points into withdrawal scenarios. And these were, these were the very early scenarios. These didn't end up being exactly what happened. But I want to show a couple of slides here to just show the power of um, combining these factors and using the data. So here we're looking at um, titles that were published before 2005, so um, titles at least six years old at this point that had never circulated, no circulations recorded in the 11 years of data we had, and where there were more than 100 other holdings in the U.S. So pretty big batch there, 816,000 titles actually fit that description. If we then um, sort of move the, the bar down from 100 to 50, um, there's another couple hundred thousand or, or more that become part of that scenario. So looking at combining these various elements, this is really the power, we think, of, of using data in this way to, to, to model whatever scenario you think your library or your consortium needs to, to undertake and to see and to calculate and gauge what the effect of those scenarios are. Um, the previous one was looking at the national level. This one's looking at the state level. Um, how many titles had zero certs and were held by more than 10 Michigan libraries or by more than five Michigan libraries um, and were published before 2005. So various kinds of ways of thinking about what might be the yield of a certain set of criteria. And obviously all of these values can be varied as part of that, uh, that process. These were just starting points that we had set up. Finally, we wanted to look carefully within the group itself to see uh, how much overlap there was, and this is a representation of that. And we evolved a couple of um, trial scenarios that eventually be, ended up being modified, but if we thought about retaining three copies within the group and we insisted that those copies have zero circs, then the number of potential withdrawal candidates would like, look like this, 561,000. If, on the other hand, 
we decided to consider titles with five or fewer circulations rather than zero, we ended up with a much bigger number of candidates. Now, five might sound like um, you know, kind of a, a high number to be considering withdrawal candidates uh, for, but remember that we're talking here about five or fewer circulations across seven libraries across an 11-year period. So it wouldn't take very many copies uh, in to, to be retained in the group to satisfy that level of demand. It's nowhere near as, um, as uh, draconian as it seems on the surface when you, uh, when you put it in context. So we presented these um, initial um, scenarios and data to the group in October, and um, there were some decisions that needed to be made about how many copies should be retained within the group. Would that be different if a title had never circulated? Would it matter if it had circulated recently? Uh, would it matter if those titles were also held widely in the collective collection outside of this group and outside of Michigan? To what degree did we want to uh, accommodate both archival and service um, parameters or, or uh, uh, needs as, as, as in terms of what we were retaining. So could a Hati Trust version serve as the archival copy? Not necessarily something that someone has to use, but to know that the, the content is safe. Do we need both a service copy and an archival copy? And really, ultimately, how should this regional collection relate to the, uh, the overall national collective collection? Other decisions related to deselection criteria. Um, should, how, to what degree should state or local hold, or national holdings be a factor in, in uh, identifying withdrawal candidates? What sort of date ranges should be used? What's the role of HATI or choice in, uh, in uh, judging deselection candidates? And finally, even gnarlier issues, I think, on the, uh, the retention side, who gets who will keep what? Um, if there are five copies and only three are wanted, which libraries keep and which library discards, and how do we manage that process that there's a need for predictability and rules and policies. Related issue, how will the benefit be shared? Um, you know, will we apportion it on collection size, available space, subject strengths, etc. And finally, as Doug pointed out, for unique titles, um, putting those in a regional or national context, these were unique titles only within the group of seven libraries, how unique are they really? Can we look at those uh, in a broad context. And so the decisions the group came to, at least the round one decisions, were to focus regionally rather than nationally, to rely on retention of local print to sort of satisfy the demand, uh, to retain three copies within the pilot group of seven libraries, uh, quite sensibly to exempt the newest items, things that were published or acquired within the last um, six plus years. Uh, and to design withdrawal allocation scenarios that allowed those libraries that had the most space pressure to remove more, to sort of, um, uh, sort of adjust based on, on uh, the particular goals of the, of the libraries in, in, in regard to space. And finally, to, to view those uniquely held copies in a, in a national context. And finally, um, uh, somebody at one of the meetings early on came up with this idea of 333 as the starting point. And it was, it was clever. It was in the, uh, the Herman Cain era of the 999, so caught all of our attention. And so we, we initially put this, um, this, this uh, first scenario together here, considered for withdrawal. Um, if something had more than three copies within the group, had circulated three times or fewer in the last three years. Well, you'll notice there are a few asterisks on this chart, and, and that, the reason for that is that the data that we had wouldn't necessarily support this particular scenario. We didn't have enough granularity in the circulation transactions to, um, for all libraries to, to be able to identify what it's served in the last three years, uh, so we, we opened that one up. And there were many other uh, changes. You'll notice there are other asterisks on this screen because there was a lot to learn as we went through this. And uh, I'm at this point going to turn it over to, to Ruth to uh, talk about some of those uh, deeper learnings. And um, please be advised that there may be a, a couple of minutes uh, as we actually change it over. Hi everybody, my name's Ruth. I'm one of the four SCS partners. 
So as Rick just finished describing, we thought we knew a lot about the MySpy collective collection back in October. And we did. But it's important to remember that SCS had only ever worked with individual libraries, uh, like GPSU, who were thinking and acting independently. As we dug deeper into the shared scenarios, issues started to emerge. Our partner Andy likes to call them learnings that cheered us up. At one point, Randy Dykeis, uh, as the director of MCLS, referred to them as cold compress moments. That didn't cheer us up. Anyway, some of our learnings felt like light bulbs turning on. Some felt more like thunderbolts, like lightning strikes when we realized that we were grappling with entirely new concepts, concepts specifically related to the shared collection and the collaborative nature of this particular project. In some cases, the need emerged for brand new terminology. Now, at this point, looking back, some of our learnings seem simple or obvious, but at the time, you can believe they were neither. My job today is to introduce you to some of these new concepts and to describe the ways in which they affected project outcomes. An early learning emerged from the need to be very, very clear about what we meant each time we used the word title. This simple drawing introduces a concept that became central to the project. If we were talking about a title owned by one library, we called it a title holding. If we were talking about all the copies of that title within the group, we called it a title set. As you'll see in a few minutes, there were times when withdrawal criteria or thresholds would be established for the entire title set, something like date of publication. At other times, withdrawal criteria would be established for individual title holdings, like the date an item was added to a particular library's collection or local circulation counts. Over the next several months, we kept thinking we had learned enough. But we kept being wrong about that. One of those lightning bolt moments came when we realized that no library can remove their candidates without factoring in other libraries removing the same titles. Again, this seems pretty obvious now. But this distinction, more than any other probably, represents the pain of collaboration. Here are two new terms, again, that remain central to the rest of the project. Withdrawal candidates represent all title holdings that meet the, the criteria for withdrawal independent of any retention requirement. For a given library, this means all the titles that meet withdrawal criteria. We also at various points referred to this as the maximum potential withdrawals a library could make if they were freed from the obligation of keeping any. The other term that's, that's appropriate here and that we embraced wholeheartedly is the concept of allocable withdrawal candidates, which represent the withdrawal candidates that can be safely removed after the three holding requirement is satisfied. Obviously, now, this will always be a smaller number. As you can imagine, these retention obligations dramatically reduce the number of withdrawal candidates for each library and raise the specter of retention commitments. Retention commitments had not actually been part of our original understanding for the project uh, or the project as it was sort of officially scoped.
So at some point in February, we were again ready to recalculate the overall opportunity given some of these very important learnings. This chart looks a lot like the one that we populated way back in October, but now with significantly diminished opportunity. This number, this, uh, this 343,000 number of potential withdrawals was not seen by the group to be big enough. So we experimented with a couple of factors and learned that the best way to achieve the, the uh, desired impact was to reduce the number of title holdings to be retained from three to two. Way back in October, the group had already agreed that to retain three title holdings was probably more than necessary. So it was a relatively easy decision to reduce this threshold. This number, this 750,000 number of potential withdrawals was seen by the group to be adequate. So now we're really on our way. But it soon became clear that we had never really fully explored the question of circulation levels. For months now, we'd been talking about three circs or fewer, but had never been entirely clear about what that meant to everybody. As it turns out, there were several possible interpretations of this concept. When we got right down to it, we realized that the idea of three circs could actually mean three very different things. We had also never questioned the significance for the group of where a particular title had circulated. Did that matter to the group? As it turned out, the three interpretations had, significant, had, had potentially significant impact on the overall opportunity. As you can see in this chart, we had to clarify whether we meant to measure use of the title set and or of the title holding. SCS investigated three scenarios on behalf of the group, and again, the resulting number of withdrawal candidates drove the decision. The group at this point decided that there would be no use restriction on the title set. That is, if seven libraries owned a title, and if it had circulated six times in one library and never in any of the others, the title set would still be a candidate for withdrawal. What they did stick with was the idea that any individual title holding that had circulated more than three times would be excluded from consideration. That is, anything that had circulated more than three times in any one library would not be a candidate for withdrawal. So at this point, we had finally arrived at a real and acceptable number of withdrawal candidates for the group this one in the lower right, the just under 536,000 title holdings would be eligible for withdrawal. Through all of this data modeling and all of these learnings, we had finally come to terms with an agreed definition of withdrawal candidates, and this is it. It's important to note here that some thresholds were set to operate at the level of the title set, and others were set to operate at the level of title holdings. I should say that throughout this process, the librarians in the group, as you might imagine, had to accommodate a lot in terms of uh, getting their minds around these various principles and scenarios. Throughout, though, they were engaged, energetic, flexible, honest, and perhaps most important, they were really very willing to learn right along with us.
we continue to be impressed with their efficient and responsible decision making. So now it was time to figure out who will withdraw and who will retain which titles. While these questions had been posed way back in October, they had not yet really been answered in any meaningful or any actionable way. And remember early on, we had agreed to accommodate different degrees of urgency in different locations, in different of the member libraries. So this obviously was going to also impact the question of allocation. Again, SCS tested a variety of scenarios, this time for allocating withdrawals. We looked at allocation by collection size, that's in the fourth column, and by the size of their maximum potential withdrawals. That's maximum potential withdrawals is in the second column, and the percentage of allocatable withdrawals is in the third column. In the end, as Doug mentioned, the group engaged in what we thought of as horse trading until all parties were satisfied with the size of their own opportunity. And as you can see, the numbers from one scenario to the next vary quite significantly. So just a few minutes ago, we reviewed the criteria by which a title set would be identified as a candidate. Likewise, title holdings. And remember that we will always retain two title holdings within the group. As it ended up, we do care where the title has circulated. Doug mentioned that. And because we had established target numbers via that horse trading, SCS, well actually our partner Eric, invented a weighted allocation scheme to accommodate both of these aspects. And it took him a long time to get a model that worked um, well enough to, re to achieve the desired result. I think it's easier to understand the allocation algorithm with this one simple example. This is a snapshot of the SCS database. The blue highlight represents one title set identified by the OCLC number in the far left column. Five libraries hold this title, so there are five title holdings. These numbers represent the individual circulation numbers for each of those holding libraries. We can see that one, the last one in the list, exceeds the circulation threshold. So four of the libraries get ranked for withdrawal. The first three get allocated for withdrawal because we always need to retain two. These two that don't get allocated for withdrawal become the retention commitments. Now that horse trading that we did and that willingness to accommodate different levels of urgency with regard to space and weeding um, was pretty significant for the member libraries. This chart highlights how much uh, responsibility some libraries absorbed in order to create opportunities for others to act. At the end of it all, and as Doug already described, SCS, and again, it was Andy really who did all this, produced just a gob of actionable lists for each member library. We could talk about these for a long time. We don't have time for that now. Um, but I do want to show what kinds of details li these lists can include. Uh, again, this is just a snapshot of three titles in one of our withdrawal candidate lists. And while the rules established these holdings to be good candidates for weeding, lots of individuals um, 
at each of the member libraries will be engaged in their review. So we've included as much data as the library wants uh, for that purpose, including location, name, call number, title, author, enumeration, publisher, series title, pub year, date acquired. We always include a link in these lists, um, which are provided in Excel, to the local catalog record and to the WorldCat record for further investigation. Number of local charges, the number of U.S. holdings up to 200, et cetera, et cetera, and various other attributes of each title in the list. Again, so that individuals can uh, make independent decisions as necessary. Finally, we also include uh, bib and item identifiers for purposes related to um, inventory control and database maintenance. So um, that's the end of my bit here. Dr. Barbara Cockrell is going to talk now about what has transpired with regard to development of the Memorandum of Understanding, and I'm delighted to turn it over now to her. There may be a slight disruption as we switch controls here one last time. Hello, everybody. Um, this is Barbara Cockrell. Um, thanks, Ruth. Um, I think I need to start off by saying that this was fun. I mean, it sounds like a lot of hard work and a lot of numbers here, but it was very enjoyable and interesting work. And uh, SCS have been fantastic partners, um, very, very responsive to the concerns of all of us. And um, you know, I kept wondering if at some point they would hold up their hands and say, this is not what we agreed to. And they never did, you know, and it was an exploratory process for all of us, and uh, it has been a lot of fun. So obviously listening to what Ruth had to say and what Rick had to say, um, there is a need for an MOU in all of this, as you can imagine. Um, it got quite complicated quite quickly. Um, and we talked very broadly about all sorts of things and changed our minds at different times. And as Ruth said, we reached new understandings. And so uh, it was obviously going to be extremely important to um, have a, a document which clearly laid out what we were, what we were agreeing to. <laughs> so the most important thing was to establish a common understanding amongst ourselves, to provide a record of that, um, given that uh, we were hoping to enter into a, an agreement that would have some kind of long-term aspect to it. Um, but also bearing in mind that there were libraries champing at the bit who had real um, needs to get on with weeding projects. And so they wanted us to, you know, to, to move this forward. So to find that balance there. Um, we wanted to build in some flexibility uh, as we learned through this process. Um, there, there was uh, a lot of change that could be built into it and even with the benefit of hindsight, if we were starting out all over, there was probably some things we would have done a little differently. Uh, but we also you know, wanted to be flexible about involving other libraries, uh, and also being very aware that the whole print environment is changing so rapidly, and that uh, you know, in the space of just a few years, we might want to change um, some of our thinking. And then finally, knowing that we needed to be able to talk in a way that was um, precise and um, consistent. Uh, and as you see, this can become very complicated. And so it, it, it was obvious that we needed some uh, written document to accompany our work with this. So just to say a little bit more, um, you know, to ensure the shared understanding, we, we started on the MOU um, in about January. So we've been three or four months into this when we began 
starting to develop the MOU language. So, you know, I say it was post hoc because, as Ruth has alluded, we, we thought we were further on than we were. And in some ways, actually working on the MOU helped craft some of the questions and define some of the direction that we went in. Um, so, you know, it was, uh, it, it was a part of the process, I would say. As Doug has also indicated, uh, different libraries had gone into this with different motivations and even different understandings of what they were getting into. Uh, and so we needed to get this all out there very clearly so there, were, there wasn't confusion uh, amongst us. We had gone and off topic, you know, we talked about all sorts of possibilities about not just collection management uh, with deselection, but maybe collection development up front. I mean, why would we be doing it at this end, but not the front end? You know, we'd, we'd gone far and wide in our discussion. So we needed to um, clearly state what the memorandum of understanding was actually about. And as Ruth pointed out, we had various different iterations of the criteria that we were working with. Then building in flexibility, this was a pilot project as we started it out. We didn't really know what we were getting into, and really we still don't. So we're trying to build in enough flexibility so that we can plan for the, for the unknown. It needs to be um, a, a working dynamic document. Um, we needed, as I was suggesting before, we needed some assurances so that libraries under pressure for weeding projects could move ahead, but uh, we also needed to build in this flexibility. Um, we were aware that we wanted to invite other libraries to be part of this project down the road, and we were also aware that we might you know, well want to be doing this in a regular, more ongoing way. Some libraries, and Doug's is one of them, uh, was very clear that they see doing this kind of work as an ongoing collection management approach. Um, other libraries weren't quite so sure. They, were, they wanted to see how this project was going to work out. Uh, so um, we needed to be able to build in those different needs. With communication with others, um, we needed to be able to communicate with our own librarians, um, and as we were developing this, um, obviously one couldn't communicate in a lot of detail about all of these different possibilities out there, but it's very important um, as we were hoping that our subject librarians were going to engage with this pro project and also the library directors. Um, some collection development um, librarians around the table either had administrator, you know, an administrator with them or they had administrative roles. Um, others didn't. Um, I should say when we met, um, we met both virtually, you know, um, by conference calls and so on, um, and also face to face as we were working on this project. Generally there were two representatives for each library. SCS often called in and were in on a phone call or for part or all of the meeting. Um, so, but there was obviously going to be a need to talk about this uh, well to others who hadn't been involved in those discussions. Uh, we needed to be able to talk to the library, to the university administration and the university community. As you know, deselection can be a very sensitive topic. We needed to make sure that we had our facts right and that we knew what we were talking about, that we, we um, created a, an environment of confidence amongst those that we were communicating with. Um, and we wanted to talk not just with other libraries in our state, but also other libraries as we're talking today. We knew that this was going to be a project that would uh, hold interest to other libraries. We wanted to be able to speak uh, in a way that was well informed. And not least, we needed to be able to communicate with our own successors. If we were heading into a, a, an agreement that was going to last for several years, um, you know, some of us are thinking that we won't necessarily be in the roles that we're currently in uh, you know, a few years down the road. And so we need to make sure that everything is clear. As we went about beginning to construct the MOU, we found, uh, we looked at what other 
uh, MOUs that were out there. I will say the Center for Research Libraries has got a, a web page with some sample MOUs and agreements on it, and we did find this very useful for seeing how other libraries had uh, worked, both on similar types of projects to this and, and also on some dissimilar projects. And uh, the Orbis Cascade Alliance work was particularly useful to us, but uh, we also found the Triangle Research Libraries Network document useful and the Tri-University group. Uh, and then the Constance Malpas um, document uh, about uh, managing print in the mass digitized library environment, that, that's a good document also for getting a sense as to what we're actually trying to address here. The philosophy about working and managing the print collections in this time of increasing online um, availability. And the executive summary is very good. This link here is not really to the, that's more just describes the project, but there's an executive summary at the beginning of the, the article document that's uh, very readable and um, I recommend. So looking at these documents, we knew that we needed to address, you know, what, what were the requirements of any new participants coming in, how long were we agreeing to be uh, working together, what were the final deselection criteria that we came up with, what were we going to say about ownership and location of items, as I think um, it's, I hope it's clear to you by now, but our idea is that we're not moving books around among our libraries. Essentially, this is a, a shared, distributed collection, and so uh, libraries are retaining copies that they already own within their library, and we're not, we're not um, creating a different um, facility or even shifting books around. Um, but if we are retaining copies of this shared collection, what kind of conditions do we want to set down about how these should be looked after? What are we going to do about damage and loss to this shared collection? Uh, do we want to say anything about circulation um, and preservation of these items? And what, how are we going to identify these titles for which we are responsible on behalf of the group? So we, we, we created a draft, and I should say there was a, there was a task force uh, that there were three of us primarily that were involved in, in this, um, and then we would create a draft and run it by the rest of the group for opinions and so on. Um, and I will say it, this it was very necessary. We did, we did a certain amount of work over the telephone and so on, but it became very necessary for us to get together in one place despite the uncertainty of Michigan snow, and so we had a meeting, I believe, early in March, where we really needed to hash over some stuff, because it was a little bit of a cold compress moment was brewing, in terms of it seemed as if some things were falling apart, or at least we weren't making fast enough process, progress to, to move things along. And some of the sticking points really related to how long libraries felt comfortable about being responsible for maintaining the shared collection, especially those libraries who were responsible for keeping a lot of it. Um, and that was something we, we really needed to address. Um, part of that concern was to do with the potential costs um, that might be implied with interlibrary loaning these materials between us, among us. Uh, some of it was to do with what the responsibility would be for replacing missing or damaged copies. Were libraries going to be responsible for inventorying that collection? And then that raised the whole specter of how many of us had actually even inventoried the list that we'd sent to SCS in the first place. So it was possible that items that a library was responsible for uh, maybe weren't even on our shelf anyway. Um, so, you know, real concerns and would we then have to pick up the bill for those? Um, then the whole business about um, how to really identify retention titles. This, at the time that we were having this discussion, we were not anticipating having a retention list at this point. As Ruth implied, we'd gone into this project as a shared deselection project, and although the idea that there would be, uh, you know, the built-in um, 
responsibility for maintaining titles was kind of in there in the ether in a way um, it hadn't really been articulated until around this point in our discussions when we, we started to realize as librarians we really needed to know what titles we were responsible for and we needed to be able to mark those somehow in our catalogs and so on. We, we, we were pretty uncomfortable with the notion that we could only work with the deselection list and everything else would be off limits and that was really what working with just the deselection list uh, would uh, imply. Um, then issues of um, how, as, and again, particularly with that idea in mind, how would we uh, integrate these retention list titles into existing work workflows and so on, uh, local versus global practices, where we as a group going to say this is how all retention lists should be handled, uh, and really the whole idea of what were we really getting into, as I say, some libraries thinking they weren't getting into something much more than a, an experiment that was becoming a, a big commitment or starting to look like it. So the resolution to all of this really came, you know, as we were having a discussion and it looked as if a library was saying, well, I can't really agree to more than five years of this, when uh, of retaining uh, titles and then really we said, well, I guess what you're saying that you know five years didn't sound like enough for other libraries to be weeding against and then the realization no 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 we're really committed to the project we are completely committed to the to this project we just can't promise that we will hold these particular titles in this kind of number for however many years and so we really got back to uh, SCS about this and we said okay we we need retention lists we need to be able to say what people are responsible for we need to, to know what those are we need we also decided that to get back to the spirit of what we'd originally started at on with this project which was to focus on access so that while we're weeding our major concern is that we continue to provide access to these materials to and libraries and users in the state to try and develop guidelines and practices that build trust but allow for the flexibility and part of that was enabling integration into existing local procedures so being comfortable with the idea that some libraries will handle these materials slightly different than other libraries and that's okay um, and then the bottom line is over and over, just reminding ourselves when we were agonizing over this, these are low use titles. People haven't been using these titles and they're widely available elsewhere. We don't really need to spend so much uh, time being so anxious about them. So after these discussions, we came up with, we have two very clear project goals. One is that the project is to responsibly reduce the size of each of our local print collections by reducing duplication of low circulating titles. I mean, that's what the heart of this is about. And then to create and maintain a distributed shared collection of those same titles so that they're still available to others in the state and to ourselves, I should say, too. And then we did, we did really put in those guiding principles. As I say, the aha moment, this is okay. You know, we're still really all on board the same project we are committed to work together with one another to solve these problems over time and we know that we are going to be facing a changing environment uh, and that's okay and we know that um, things will change we'll have other libraries coming in I may be responsible for fewer titles down the road and so on but what we're saying is we will work together with one another and keep communicating with one another transparently about what we are doing so that we are being responsible about the implications of our actions. So other elements that are in, the, in our MOU, we've agreed that we will do this for 15 years with the regular three-year review and then the option of more frequent um, review as we proceed if a library requests it. Uh, libraries aren't required to go into this more than once if they don't want 
on to, but they will be responsible for maintaining their titles. But some libraries may choose to regularly go through a refreshment of their data and update what their responsibilities are uh, and have the option to withdraw other titles, others won't. But there is an option to be released um, from the MOU if that's the way it has to be, uh, but that we that um, the library we would work with other li the other libraries to minimize the impact of that. We will all make our best effort to maintain and preserve and make these titles available and that circulation and interlibrary loan will be according to the local library's practice. As far as replacements concerned, we are suggesting that libraries will follow their usual workflows and procedures and we have this phrase in here that they will make a good faith effort to respond to lost and missing materials in a way that displays sound judgment in the context of the particular title and its availability. Uh, and that also includes the ability to not really, to not hold on to old editions of materials if that's not the normal practice. The only thing that is absolutely essential is that we will notify one another of what we're doing and so that is part of what we're agreeing to that we will make sure that if we're unable to replace something or don't plan to we'll let the other libraries know so down the road we have a meeting coming up in July um, currently we're all busy weeding um, but, but we hope to get together in July possibly August to pin down the mechanism and procedures for notifying the group about lost retention titles. We want to talk about what we should do about a standardized bibliographic identifier for retention items and work out some details together with discussions with SCS, I think, about how we might integrate new libraries into the mix. Um, we, we need to talk about the details a bit. But we definitely think that this has a lot of potential and benefits. Uh, it's great fun working together with a the collection development libraries and figuring out these issues and we really see a lot of benefit from addressing these shared problems that we're all facing about what to do with um, these legacy print collections. We think that the data that we've got will allow us to move forward boldly and responsibly with clearing some of the materials that really aren't very useful in our libraries out so that we can open the library spaces for new possibilities and we, put, we fully expect that we will be modifying and adjusting our MOU as we move forward. So thank you very much indeed and uh, we certainly will be very pleased to entertain questions. Okay, we have a few questions. The first one came in during Rick's presentation, and it asks, what do you mean by unique titles in the previous slide? Unique to the group or unique to OCLC? These, <clears throat> excuse me, these were unique to the group. We were, these were uniquely held, not necessarily unique, but um, uh, instances where there was only one holding within the group of seven libraries that participated. Okay, thank you. Now, did you end up establishing a last copy agreement? No, we didn't. Um, what we decided was that both of, both of our copies would be circulating copies, and um, we, we were not making a, an effort to preserve or to treat any one of them as an archival copy. This goes back to the whole idea of it, this being primarily about access, not preservation, certainly not in that archival preservation sense. Why did you start with monographs and not serials? <laughs> well, well I, can... I think, yeah, well, I was just going to say, Doug, I think Doug had already mentioned that I think many of our libraries had already done some work with serials, and so we were ready for the next thing. Doug, what do you want to say? <laughs> yeah, I would just say I think for a lot of us, we've been aggressively discarding serials. And so for many of us, I mean, I can speak selfishly for ourselves. You know, I don't have a lot of serials left on my shelves because we've been discarding like mad. So for us, it didn't really make sense to start with serials. Um, there was some interest in that. Perhaps it's a future project down the road for the libraries that are interested. But for a number of us, it just wasn't really a, 
a lot of interest in that type of project because we weren't really interested in retaining serials. We were really interested in the monograph as a different type of issue. And, and just from the SCS perspective, uh, all of our um, data work and services are geared toward monographs. We, uh, we, we don't work with serials at this point, so that clarified things for us pretty quickly. Do you give any consideration to condition of the material when deciding what to retain? No. From um, a, sorry, Barbara. No, go. You, you, go. I was gonna, this is Ruth. I was just going to say that from a data perspective, there's no, there's no data to represent condition. And so none of the decision-making algorithms could factor in condition. That's only uh, going to be possible with book in hand. And so uh, from all of the sort of data crunching aspects, the answer is no. OK, so if it's not too crass to ask, how is your work with SCS funded? Um, it's not too crass to ask, um, and each individual library was expected to pay a portion of the cost there, and so it's a, really a per library fee that we each had to pay to be part of the group. Um, and so that's sort of how it was split up there. So each of them started their load, and it was scaled, so we'd already worked with SCS, and so they already had um, our holdings there, so we paid a slightly different rate than some of the libraries that were new to working with SCS. And, and I, maybe I would add to that that all the billing was actually done through MCLS. So we, we SCS, did not bill libraries individually. There was an, an aggregate fee that, um, that we billed MCLS for. And how it was apportioned um, yeah, is not something that we were, uh, we were involved in. OK. Have you had discussions on how to avoid building new, duplicative, yet little used collections going forward? Or does this just deal with the collections as they exist now? Right now, I think it's just on the collections that exist now. It's just sort of talked to my mind. We're hoping that this will lead into something much bigger there. I think that, you know, in many ways, for a group that never worked together, getting rid of the chunk that we know that really nobody uses, nobody really wants, we're all sort of obligated to hang on to. It's an easy way to, an easy project to tackle, much more than tackling, you're now not going to buy these books because somebody else is going to buy them and rely on them for access there. But my, my hope is that this will lead to other projects like that, looking at like what Orbis Cascade Alliance is doing um, and some of those other types of projects. On one of Ruth's slides, she listed a preservation candidate's actionable list. Can you talk a little more about what that is and what defines a preservation candidate? Ruth, I think that's for you. Yeah, I'm trying to think how to do that. Yeah, well. And if we look at um, the definition of what is actionable. Remember, we go back to that basic concept of a title set and a title holding. And um, what we finally decided, our definition, was that a title set would become a candidate if there were three or more holdings within the consortium. That, that only when we reached that threshold were we going to consider the title. Um, and the intention was to retain two uh, title holdings within each of those title sets. Uh, the title set is, um, is excluded if it's new, if it has been published since 2005. A title holding is excluded if it was added to any one library's collection since 2005. So again, this distinction between when a title set would be considered for withdrawal and when a title holding would be um, considered for withdrawal. Um, the, the, the one of the primary drivers, though, was that no single 
holding for any one library would have had the title circulating more than three times, that those would always be retained by the owning library. I, I, I think actually uh, I, I, I heard that question slightly differently, which was <clears throat> had to do with preservation candidates and, and um, oh. what we mean by preservation candidates uh, are those titles that are scarcely held uh, in the collective collection. And so in this case, um, items that had fewer than five uh, holdings anywhere in the U.S. would be considered something that was worthy of attention, uh, that, that the libraries would not want to deselect these without looking further into them to determine if they truly were scarcely held and therefore should be retained and contributed to the collective collection or whether um, uh, whether they were, sometimes the scarcely held titles are scarcely held for a reason and, and, and uh, it makes sense to deaccession them anyway, but um, the preservation candidate list is, is geared to focusing uh, people on titles that are, that are not widely held and, and potentially at risk. All right, thank you. Now, how are the government documents filtered? Uh, there's a couple of um, we use the uh, a couple of fields in the the leader to the mark record and in the um, material designation fields to to filter out um, the ones that actually get through to us. Uh, when people are pulling extracting records from their systems, uh, they're typically focusing on print monographs uh, and uh, and those same factors to to filter out the uh, the government document monographs. So the ones that that, that um, fit through. Um, I'm blanking on the specific fields right now, but we have a um, um, standard routine for pulling those out. What has been done to convince faculty in this process and involve them in the process? I think it's very... Think... Go ahead, Barbara. No, you can. It's fine. I think we're uh, going to say the same thing. I think it varies from institution to institution. We. Um, I know some institutions are having their faculty very heavily involved in reviewing all their withdrawal candidates in, in these. For a lot of us, though, we have faculty advisory committees um, through a faculty governance system. So I can say at Grand Valley, we've met with them, we explain the project, we explain why we're doing the project and what it really means for the collection there. Um, again, I think it varies. Some, at some universities, faculty are very heavily involved in all those elements of collection development. At other institutions, like Grand Valley, for example, they're perhaps a little bit less involved there. So I think it's going to vary from institution to institution on what you see. I don't know if that was you were going to say, Barbara, or if you have different thoughts. Yes, it, it was really. And um, they weren't involved in the de determining the criteria that we were talking about, you know, that whole iterative process that uh, we went through with SCS as to how to define what our criteria were. Um, and yes, how, how we will um, communicate with the, the faculty will will certainly vary institutionally. It's not to say again if we you know if we were to if we were to revisit this or do it over from scratch or you know knowing knowing what we know now we might we might actually open up the conversation. As I say, it really was uncharted territory that we were walking into. I mean, we we really didn't know too much about what we were going to get out of this and so it's quite difficult to even involve our own librarians as much as we might have wanted to truly. I think, I think for us for the weeding, when we look about the weeding, it's there are different liaisons really a lot, they have their relationships with the individual faculty so we leave it up to them how to work with the faculty and generally how they do it is they'll inform that they're their departments that I'm weeding this summer. This is something we do, we're trying to get them the routine of faculty used to the fact that we weed every summer. And if they have any questions, we'd be happy to sit down and talk with them, explain what we're doing on, address any concerns that they might have there. But it's really, as far as the withdrawal things, for us, it's really left up to that liaison because they really have their relationships with the faculty. Actually, I mean, I would like to say I'm, I'm really looking forward to the, the uh, seminar that's going to be on uh, Wednesday, which is talking about planning and communication uh, with shared collection management. So, so both that and the Constance Malpas um, presentation, which is going to be about the bibliographic aspects, are both highly relevant to what we are trying to address, and I think both should have some very interesting points. All right. Well, thank you. Um, we are just about out of time, so. 
The rest of the questions that we were not able to get to today will be sent to the presenters and they will get back to you through email, I believe is what we've decided. So I want to thank you, Doug, Rick, Ruth, and Barbara for your insight into collaborative decision making. Thank you also to all our attendees. We hope you found today's session useful. You'll soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and return the form to us. Your comments are very valuable and help Alex to plan new continuing education offerings. I'd like to thank Mary Miller, the organizer for this online pre-conference, as well as Eva Sorrell, Alyssa Novak, and Carrie Cassio for providing technical support for today's webinar. To support our colleagues on the Continuing Education Committee's Technical Support Subcommittee provide make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Information about all ALEX webinars and continuing education events can be found on the ALEX homepage at ala.org slash ALCTS. There are two additional webinars as part of this pre-conference, tomorrow's Shared Collection Management Bibliographic Aspects, and on Wednesday, we will have Shared Collection Management Planning and Communication. Another ALEX pre-conference will be taking place June 12th through the 14th, called The How and Why of Research, What is the Rock in Your Shoe? Thank you again for joining us this afternoon, and we hope you will participate in other Alexa events in the future.